So welcome everyone. Uh, this talk is about Basel, uh, and we, here we are with Klaus Helling. He is a software engineer uh, in Google since 2011. Is that right? 2011. And since last year, uh, he has started working on Basel. Please welcome Klaus. Okay, so thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity to present Basel, the open source build system I'm involved in. And the purpose of this talk is to give you an idea of what are the ideas behind Basel and a bit about the look and feel. Um, yeah. So, what is Basel? Short answer, it's a build tool. That is, like Make and many other tools, it organizes how we get derived files from source files, so typically compiling stuff. Um, yeah. It is a tool that is used at Google for over a decade, or it's a core of a tool. Google has some specific um, extensions compiled in. And from that, given that it's been in use at Google for so long, you can already arrive that it's mainly focused at the use case we have at Google. Or whenever there's a design decision to be made, it's made to better support that use case, which is you have a large single code base. So the majority of code at Google is in one big repository, and that is under active development. And basically, you build everything from head all the time. So that's usually called a large one repository, or one repository, and it happens to be large at Google with tens, or, um, tens of millions of files and tens of thousands of engineers working on it. And it is an open source since 2015, so only recently being open sourced. Okay, so why yet another build system? As mentioned already, it's optimized for large repositories. So what Bazel tries to do is to be fast and not only by running things in parallel, but by also aggressively caching. Uh, but do so without losing correctness. That is the main focus on Bazel, to build correctly in the sense that if you now clean up everything and compile again, you get the same result that Bazel gives you with caching enabled. And the same ideally means not only functionally the same program, an equivalent program, but really byte by byte the same thing which actually is a bit of a challenge with all the timestamps that enter this compilation all the time. Okay, and the other thing which you can deduce from the fact that it's meant for a large code base is that you uh, go for a declarative style. So you separate the concerns of writing an application and building how you build it. So you say, this is a C program and have some specialized knowledge about building that. For a company like Google, that is necessary because you have specialized engineers in building an application and others who know best how to optimize for the architecture we're running our things on. And it's also generally useful to have a central point where you maintain the rules how you build your files or your derived artifacts. Okay, so how does it work? and we'll go through an example later, but the general overview is you get a target, I want to build that thing, then you read all the build files, or actually all the files you need, all the build files you need. There's nothing like recursive calling or, um, yeah, no recursive calling, you would just read and construct the whole graph of all the dependencies you have recursively, but it's all in the same process. And from that, you decide which actions you need to do, so which invocations of compiler and so on, and then you execute it. Uh, except if you've done the same command already with the same input, because then you don't have to do it twice. Okay, so generally generic build tool. And let's to give you a bit of feeling how, how the whole thing looks like. Let's go through an example. 
Oh, before, one of the main design features is that the repository is big and we say we, we read all the both files. There can be a lot of them. And the assumption is that it's definitely true for Google, you work on the same code base uh, for an extended amount of time and compile again, run tests, change code, run tests again. So it's worth optimizing for subsequent invocations of build and not only for the first one. And therefore, to not compute the whole dependency graph over and over again, Bazel has a client-server architecture that is, once you start Bazel for the first time in a works, working directory on a code base, it will start a server in the background that constructs the dependency graph and keeps it in memory. And once you ask uh, for another build or another test in the same uh, working directory, uh, in the same checkout, basically, same workspace, then the information will already be in memory and uh, only updated with changes made to the files since you last involved Bazel. And that's also how we can handle the whole dependency graph in memory and read everything um, without losing too much time on pre-computing all the, uh, on computing the build graph over and over again. Okay, but I said declarative style, how does it look? Let's look at a simple example. We want to write Hello World, which is a simple program, except uh, to demonstrate a point, I choose to call a library, um, make a call to a library, so this program depends on a library, as it is usual with also bigger pieces of software. And in this case, a simple C library, so you have a header file, and you have an implementation. Okay, that could be a typical, well, part of the source tree, but it shows already all the relevant parts. In that simple case, and now we want to tell Bazel how to build something useful from that. The first thing is we have a workspace file, which in that simple example, and in actually many examples, is just an empty file. It serves two purposes. On the one hand, to give the border of the code base and the reference point where all absolute paths or absolute, yeah, absolute names of, of targets to be built refer to. And it also allows to specify external dependencies that are built in, so external repositories. Um, as I said, Bazel wants to construct the whole graph, so it also needs about external repositories that are part of the build. And, but for the, the main use case that you have everything in a big repository, you won't have external repository. So very often it's an empty file just to get the namespace quite clear. And then you have the actual build files. In this case, you have a library, or oh, start from the top. Next to the C program, you have a build file saying, look, I have a binary, it's written in C. It has a name, this is the source file, and by the way, it depends on that library. And for the library, it's similar, say this is a library, it has a name, and all the C files in that directory are my source files, and all the header files belong to that library. So the important thing to notice is what is not in that build file. And this is how all the details about what is my C tool chain, uh, do I do a cross compilation or not, uh, what is my source and target architecture, that all is specified elsewhere, or you use the, for C, there is also some knowledge built in. And the whole point is you don't have to specify it at each invocation of the compiler, but at a separate place. Okay, so now let's try to build Hello World and see what, what happens. The first thing is we want to build a target, so we need to know what the target is. From the namespace, we see it's in the top level package, so we look say, okay, we need to know about that package, and then we actually find the build file and read it. <coughs> Once we know, then in that build file we see, okay, it's a C binary, we discover dependencies. There are two declared dependencies, one is the source file, and the other is the library. Okay, now we need to build a library, and performing that, again, the important thing is what is not shown on the slide, 
Basil also implicitly records which toolchain tool it is building things for. So if you later change that, it knows that all the binaries have to be rebuilt again. Okay, but then the library is also straightforward. It's found in a package, so you read the build file in the directory. And as already mentioned, the whole dependency graph <coughs> is built at once and kept in memory in the server. Okay, then you see clock expressions, which means you have to really read the content of the directory. You discover the files you need. And now you've discovered all the things you need for your build. Then you can evaluate the rules and know which actions you have to perform, so which compilation steps. In this case, you compile the C file to an object, build a library, compile the other binary, compile the other C file, and then link everything together. So that, this is the graph that is actually productive. This is how we get to derived files from source files. These are the actions. But the important thing is there are all the other dependent things we read during the planning of the execution and we need to keep track of in order to discover if something changes. And that's what Babel does. It really records all the dependencies, not only those that are source files. Uh, for example, if you add a file to that directory, just simply adding the file, then of course nothing has changed with the targets we've built, but we discover that the content of the directory has changed, and by discover I actually mean on operating system whether it's possible, Basil tries to be notified by the operating system about changes, but it can always fall back to restarting everything. If so, we definitely try to avoid reading all the files again, but actively try to find out what's changed. In any case, the contents of the directory has changed, which means the whole part of the graph gets invalidated. Everything that, that's not very visible there. So basically, the directory has changed, so everything that is reachable from here uh, needs to be redone. Yeah. Uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, so, uh, yeah, that's not very visible, <laughs> but basically since we discovered that, uh, sorry, that a large part of the graph is invalid, we walk through the graph again, and once we hit the, the library rule, we see that since the content of the directory has changed, we need to extend the, or the action graph so differently, so we add the missing part of the action graph, and then we know what needs to be done again. So again, the, the point I'm trying to make is that by really recording everything that went into that build, we can detect changes and don't have to, um, we're, we're not missing updates, so we can rely on it being correct, so we don't have to clean everything and start all over again. Okay, so actions. As already mentioned, these are the, the productive part. These, comp these are invocations of compilers and linkers and so on. So they actually do something, they generate artifacts and hence take the biggest part of the time of the system. So that's why it's particularly interesting in avoiding redoing them again. <coughs> so we've seen the dependency graph and uh, shows when something has changed and we need to redo it again. But there's also caching of actions themselves in the sense that if the input hasn't changed, we don't need to redo the action, you know, the output will be the same, so we don't do it. Of course, for that to work correctly, Basil needs to know all the inputs and all the outputs of an action. And not on, uh, so Basil needs full knowledge about that because if you read more files than you declare, you might accidentally hit, or you might not redo an action that needs to be redone. So conceptually that means there are no such uh, done something targets where you have an empty file. 
saying, yeah, I've done all the prerequisites or tasks, but you actually do declare all the inputs and outputs that go into a target. And you, all your actions are supposed to only read the input that are declared. Now say, suppose that sounds like a huge burden on the person writing the build file. Well, there is some tools that help. Basil has built in a concept of a sandbox to make it easier to write correct build files, which only um, access the input they declare. And so by a sandbox, that's basically an isolated environment where only the declared inputs and the declared tools of the action are present, and where only the declared outputs are moved out. Um, depending on the operating system, that can be implemented in a different way. It could be a change route or is. There's also the implementation where you just make a temporary directory link, a sim link in everything you need and nothing else. So that is not a security feature. It's just a tool to help you um, detect incorrect declarations in your build file. And for that, it works really reliable. And the other advantage of having full knowledge of all your input and output files is that you can send then an action to be executed to a remote place. So you don't have to build everything on your own workstation. You can use a build cluster if you happen to have one. And that, using a build cluster with fully declared inputs and outputs, is really powerful in a situation like Google where basically everyone works on the same code base because that allows having a cache that is between different developers. So not only not compiling a file if you already compiled it, but if someone else working on the same code base did it, because then the shared remote execution will tell you, ah, I know the answer that it isn't. And as I said, so if a lot of people work on the same code, that can save a lot of time and be very efficient. Okay, that's the general idea of how Bazel works. And now I've shown C program. What about other languages? So first of all, Bazel has specialized knowledge about a lot of programming languages, including C, C++, Java, Python, and, and a bunch of others. It also has uh, generic rules, in particular a rule called gen rule, which is, well, generically to, to generate artifacts. It's basically just, no, it is a shell command to say, execute that shell command from these inputs and outputs, and to help you specify the shell command, you have variables that might look familiar. It's dollar add, dollar lesson, and so on. So that rule should look pretty familiar. Basically, it's the only rule you have to make files. But at least it means you're generically enough to build arbitrary things, because make can do that. And in Unix, everything is a shell command, so you can build it. Nevertheless, as I mentioned, that the idea is to have a central declarative place about how to build things. So, um, or, yes, for every language, you want a central place where you have the knowledge of how to build things. And it doesn't scale to add all that information into Bazel because there are more and more programming languages and so on coming up over and over again. I mean, it worked as long as it was a tool just for one company where you knew all the languages you had and could add and control the tool yourself. But in general, that's not a good approach to add specialized knowledge of each and every language in the world into a single tool. So that's why there, well, there's a need for a way to extend the build files, but there actually is one. And that's called Skylark. It's it's an extension language. It has a syntax that looks quite similar to Python, and also semantic is quite similar. But it's well, it's basically is Python restricted to some core where you don't have too far-reaching side effects, so that you can evaluate things locally, don't need global state, 
and have at least the declaration of what you want to build in a very insulated way. Yes, and of course deterministic, because you, you determine you want what you want. So in the simple case, and as I hinted on the general, that is quite a generic case already, is that you can code up the knowledge how to build your, your language that isn't built into Bazel, or um, describe how to compile that language by means of already existing rules. I mean, it could be just generals all over the place, so that typical example, yes, to build that language, you just have to run that shell script, and by the way, you have several targets for, I don't know, uh, the binary and binary. And, or just from that source, you can derive several targets. So the typical example is documentation. You have you whatever RST file, and then you create a man page, a web page, and so on. And they want to have in one rule, and you have commands for that, so that would be the case. Yes, here's a general, and I generate these five things from that source file. And whenever I write that declarative style, please add all the, all the rules to build those things. And here's an example how such a thing looks like. And as promised, the language really looks like Python, including all the things that you can uh, pass parameters by name and not only positional, which is very useful. You can add default values for parameters. You can do some simple com computations. And then you can, well, and you can map it to already existing rules, like the general, which is, is a native rule. And, yeah. So, Simple enough, and as hinted, you can even, the typical case, not only do some computations on the parameter to set up your command and set all the environment correctly, and then that to make a full can also do that conditionally depending on parameters, or you can map to multiple native rules so that by one declaration you declare a bunch of targets that semantically belong together. So, you write such an extension in a separate file with the ending .bzl, and then in your build file, or in every build file that needs that extension, you load it by saying this is the file where the extension is described, and specifying the symbols you want to import from that file so that by reading a build file, you actually know what is in your namespace and not suddenly uh, accidentally declare commands you're not aware of. And I don't have an example for that, but uh, Skylark is also, also has full access to the action interface. So in the more complicated cases, you can really not only refer to native rules, but specify actions in detail, um, including all the things that native rules can do, like checking parameters for types, uh, checking that parameters are present, and and these kind of things. So I won't go into more details of Skylark. Instead, I'll answer the question that comes up occasionally is, why does it, did it take so long? Or why does the whole process of open sourcing take so long? I said, yes, it was open source 2015. And in a sense, it's still going on. There are still some tests which are not open source. There are some functionality which we intend to have open source, but is not there yet. Um, yeah, and there is to remember that it's only became an open source project after a lot of years of internal usage on a single repository. I mean, a large one, but a single one. And in fact, it's, as I said, it's basically not a fork of the tool used at Google, it is the same tool, just Google has some extensions compiled in. So that also means that everything has to work all the time, also for the non-published use cases. Google, um, Google can't afford to not have the engineers build software for an extended period of time. But once um, you have a, but from that history that it used for years only for an internal use case, a lot of um, properties of the code base arose which made it hard to open source it or still block open sourcing some tests. The one is if you have all 
one huge code base with a lot of useful libraries you tend to use them. So you have a lot of dependencies, including libraries that solve a problem that also open source libraries would solve, but they are Google specific, <coughs> internal technology, and so on. And of course, if you want to make a tool open source, you need all the dependencies open source. So cutting dependencies or finding replacement libraries is a big task. <laughs> Yeah, so internally you have all the libraries, so it's just easy to use them, so you do it. And historically, as there was this only code base, there was a big focus on these languages that are widely used at Google. So the whole extension interface, Skylark, is something that only very late in the process came. And also, still, there's a bit of focus on the built-in languages, and we're trying to remove that and make it a more generic tool. Oh yeah, and if you have a large code base, then it's very easy to, or if you have only the one code base where things are supposed to work and where you build everything from, then you have the advantage that for all interfaces you know all the call sites, so you can change it easily, which is not that nice for an open source project if things change all the time. And of course, if it's, it wasn't intended originally as an open source project, you find hard coded paths everywhere. And it's, I mean, a lot of things that are all easy to fix, but in some, that's why it takes such a while to, to get it open source. Yeah, I, I just know what my compiler is. And, and a lot of small details like that. Uh, that's why the process of open sourcing is still in parts going on, even so what is open source is a useful tool in its own right. And yeah, and that brings me to the roadmap where is Basel trying to move to. So the big goal is Basel 1.0. And I think on our roadmap we currently say we want to be there sometime next year. Hopefully. What does it mean? So the first thing is we want the public repository to be the primary one. At the moment, the Google internal repository is the primary one, and then at least once a day, it gets exported to the public one. That sounds more like a technical detail, where you commit it first and then export it, but that has a lot of consequences. In particular, since you first pushed it up, we want to first push to the public repository, that means the interfaces need to be well defined. You can't do it at the moment, you just import internally, run all the internal tests that you care about, and then see whether something fails. And that is a big commitment saying we need to get the interfaces well documented and well tested, because still Google is using the tool and can't afford uh, having the engineers not have a build tool for a longer time. And to be a pr proper open source project, we also want all the design reviews in public. We're working towards that, but there's still some use cases which are Google only, and so sometimes things come up, but there is more and more going in the direction of having generic interfaces and open design reviews. Oh yeah, and at the moment it happens that the whole core team are persons employed at Google, which is, for a true open source project, we, we opt to also extend that base. And as I said, I mean, prerequisite for all that is to get things stable and well documented. And while that is the big goal, what we're aiming for, there are a lot of kind of technical improvements that we hope to solve on the way there. For example, we'd like to improve the remote execution API. As I said, remote execution is very powerful, especially if you can share caching between different persons working on the same code base. So Basil, I hope I'm not saying something wrong, does have an remote execution, does have an API and a prototype implementation, um, but we hope to make that a more standard API that is well documented and used by a lot of people and get out of this prototypical state. And as I said, for it to become a community project and uh, to be a generically useful tool, we, we aim to have more um, repositories of specialized build tools for languages which 
aren't that important within Google and hope that there is a community contributing it all. There is a community and we hope that this increases and there's a good collection of uh, rules so that basic can become more a language agnostic tool that knows how to organize compiling, how to do caching correctly, dependency tracking and have the specialized knowledge about individual programming languages in a separate place. And the other thing which there's currently work going on is improving the story of remote repositories. I said that is something that only came up, became an issue with open sourcing. As within Google, there is only that one repository. I mean, it's working. You can specify remote repositories as a dependency in your build file. They get fetched, they get compiled. Um, but there are a lot of improvement, things to improve. In particular, recognizing if you fetch something in the hash value, or the declared hash value hasn't changed. It doesn't matter that you're now fetching it from a separate place. You still can cache it. Or even saying, yes, we know these are the artifacts coming out of that remote repository. I don't even need to recompile that if the repository hasn't changed. Then what about recursive remote dependencies if some remote repository depends on another remote repository? And what if two then point to the same thing? So there is, there, it is, Working in principle, but there's a lot of more improvements to be made, and we're working on it. And a lot of small details. Also, something which I didn't mention on the slide, but is also very big, is other platforms. So making sure Basel runs well on iOS, on Windows. The Windows, especially, is a lot of work going on. And yeah. So to sum up, what are the approaches of Basel? Uh, it has a declarative approach, so you say what you want to build and then have a separate place where you have the knowledge how to build it. You really track all the dependencies, including tools, including things that are implicitly read by a tool. And that is what ensures correctness and you have some support to help you really know what you're reading. So the hand boxes. And that full knowledge enables fast builds because you can more aggressively cache, you can execute remotely very easily because you know what is needed and can share that between different, it's a, different people working on the same code base. And it is open source and the plan is to commit, and there is some commitment to that and the plan is to get a fully useful open source tool. Oh, it is already useful to but make it a more community project, not a project dominated by one company. And you are invited to try it yourself. So there's a home page. Uh, the whole code is at GitHub. There are two mailing lists, one for people who just want to use the tool, and a second mailing list for discussion on how to extend Basel further, how to develop it. Uh, we have an IRC channel, and yeah, all release, at least all release artifacts are signed. And pretty fast, so that is, the end of my presentation, then I'm here for questions. And we also have a stand next door where you can meet the base developers today and tomorrow, the whole day. Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, are there any plans on making Basel um, um, uh, more modular? Right now it's uh, one big binary file which contains a lot of dependencies. Uh, it's 100 plus megabytes. Um, I know this could be necessary for, for the re um, to make it reproducible, but... Uh, uh. So I'm not sure what you mean by more modular. So the code itself is organized in a modular fashion. There's also an in internal interface where you can add more functionality. Um, and another thing that goes in the direction of modularity is to get more of the specialized knowledge out of the tool into files describing builds. But it probably will always be a kind of biggish binary. Um, 
And we certainly won't get rid of the dependencies of the JVM to, is this written in Java, and we'll save it. Or, or what precisely do you mean with more modular? Uh, I mean more modular in the sense that, a lot of, so you can remove a lot of the, the uh, bundled dependencies that's in the binary. Uh, uh, no, 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 uh, the reason why the binary is so large uh, are the, uh, oh, uh, the built in things here. There are some plans in that direction, but I don't think they are the, the highest priority at the moment. So there are plans to make it a more generic tool and not bundle everything, but on the other hand, it's very useful if you have one binary and it just works, which also makes deployment easy and that is a big thing. But there are plans in that direction, but not very much. I think there were other questions. Ah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. One question is, as you said, it's a tool with a history. <coughs> Why did you decide to open source this now and not like five years ago? Was there a particular reason? And another one, will we see Android and Chrome using this tool? Okay, let's start with the answer to the second question. Yes, Android development. Oh. Hmm? Uh, well, you can know the world better than the future. Um, so, we are talking to the Android teams and the Chromium teams. If you look at the Android source code, there is actually now there are public files in there. Not all of the SDK is currently built with Bazel, but you know, we hope that we'll get there. We'll see. Uh, for Chrome, um, they have built a lot of uh, their own infrastructure. They use ex remote execution extensively. Our remote execution story is not stable yet. Um, so it will take a while before we're at a point where they could switch over, but we certainly hope that that will happen eventually. And the question why open source now and not earlier, that's you know better because I joined the team only a year ago and I'm happy yes. that I could join an open source project yeah. because I like working the open source and having contact with external contributors. But okay, why, why now? Um, I, yeah, it sort of <laughs> seemed to be the right time. Um, there are things I can't talk about. Hello. Um, how does it identify the tool chain it's using, and how does it detect changes in the tool chain for C, for example? <laughs> uh, Sorry, I'm over here. Okay, so... Um, excuse me, everyone. Uh, we're still running the session. It's question and answer. If you could keep it more quiet, we would appreciate that. And if you want to leave, if you could leave quietly from both sides, and also if you could repeat the questions for other people, that would be good. Uh, because the other microphones is not. Yeah, if you could repeat the question. Okay. So the the question was, uh, how does Basel identify changes in the tool chain? Um, okay. Uh, to be fair, it wouldn't notice if you change the content of the compiler that is not, that is an external, but the tool chain is declared, I mean there is a declared tool chain, even if you don't, don't do it explicitly, internally Bazin knows which compiler it did use, which libraries, it. also if you know better you can also correct, uh, and, uh, it, there is always a declared set of tools that are to be used, and a declared target, and that information is kept into the graph, and if that declared compiler changes, then all the actions get invalidated and have to be done with the new tool chain. So it's not, but it, as far as I know, it doesn't track the, the value, the content of external tools. So if you just happen to sneak in a new compiler, then that wouldn't be worth notice. But if you declare you want to build for a different tool chain, then that is noticed. Okay, thanks. So you manually say, I'm going to use GCC 5.4, for example, and then if you change that, then it recompiles everything. Yeah, yeah so, I don't know how it works. Um, how does the uh, work together with... Um, with um, external um, dependencies and build things like 
got uh, port for Java, we've got POMs, uh, we've got uh, NPM, and all these things. Okay, so the question was how Bazel works together with external dependencies, in particular specialized ones for languages. So, um, what you can declare is saying this is an external source tree or an external repository or by various means download it as a git, specified git hash, download it as a file and check that it better has the hash value. And you can also drop in a build file. But it doesn't have built-in knowledge about the various packaging, various packaging formats. It has some generic things, it knows what the Java archive is, it knows what the zip file is, it knows the tar archive and so on. But beyond that, you have to describe how, how you build it. But you can drop into a given source tree your own build file that then has a specialized information in that source tree doesn't bring build file. So you can at least learn them separately. Yep. Okay. Uh, uh, two quick questions. So the first one is that it, uh, it's important in Java, right? So yes, Bezos. So what if you have a project where you need to compile it on a platform where Java is either not available or there's not resources enough to run it? Sorry, uh, didn't. What if you need to have a project where you need to compile on a platform where Java either is not available or it's too big of a dependency it doesn't run properly on the machine? Uh, so the question was, what do we do if Java is not available? So, Bazel itself is in, written in Java, so on the host platform you need to be able to run Java full stop, otherwise you can't run Bazel. But if you have a cross toolchain, you can cross compile for a platform where you don't need to run Java if, if the program you're trying to compile isn't written in Java, obviously. Okay, so the second question is more about Okay, so does uh, committing code into Bazel require signing a CLA? Hmm? So it does. Does contributing to the code require signing a CLA? Yes. Uh, Nothing to there. Contributing to Bazel requires a CLA, signing a CLA. So that was the question. The answer is yes, it does. And uh, yeah. So, but the, the code itself is under the Apache license. So if you say, yeah, you don't want to cooperate with Google, technically you have the ability to fork him. So it's, I would prefer to have it as, a, to, as contributions to the project. So one question here. Uh, ah. It's here. Okay. Down here. Yeah. yeah. Hello. So how do you implement the sandboxing and the parallelism? Is it a separate process that runs for each action and some form of MPC between the actions? Uh, okay, so the question. Yeah. So how do we implement sandboxing in detail? Okay. So the sandbox on Linux, we use uh, a user namespace, and then we create a mount namespace and a network namespace, and then we set those up to show just the files that you have declared. Um, and it, I mean, it effectively runs as your user, but um, the the writes work out in some way. Uh, on macOS, we use the existing uh, macOS sandboxing mechanism, which you know you probably know about. Um, on Windows, we don't currently have a sandbox, um, but we hope to add that at some point. We have a question at the back. Yeah. Hi there. Thanks for the talk. So I was wondering, uh, at the start of your talk, you mentioned that at Google there's a source tree that has 10 to the power 7 source files in it, which is quite big. Um, that also means that for more complex applications, the dependency graph, like the dependency graph itself, would already not fit in memory. How does Blaze deal with that? Is there like some graph partitioning, or does it only like partially evaluate the graph? Or uh, so the question was, what does Blaze do if the dependency graph itself doesn't fit in memory? Um, it assumes it fits in memory and. <laughs> I mean, it only looks at the part of the dependency graph that you need for your target. So you don't look at the whole repository, only your target, and then recursively discover what other files you need. But the approach is to hope that it will always fit in memory, and then have big enough memory. <laughs> Hi. Uh, is it possible after all the building is done to use Bazel to generate uh, some like uh, 
Docker images ready to deploy with all the our binaries and the dependencies. So the question was whether Bazel can build Docker images or use Docker images. Then no, no. To, after we have uh, all the building done, then yes. to package our binaries and libraries into some form of a container or packages like RPMs or apps. So Bazel. So the question was, can Bazel package um, the artifacts created? And the, the answer is, Bazel has knowledge about certain package formats. As far as I know, definitely including Docker, Debian packages, MPMs, and, well, TAR archive, obviously. And I'm not sure which else is, is already existing, but uh, the plan is if there are more packaging formats needed, then to better have that as an extension instead of compiling more specialized knowledge into the original binary. But, I mean, whatever you know how to build a binary, you can also use the generator artifacts to, to get a new artifact which is in the package. There's just an artifact as any other artifact. Um, you said one of your goals was the support for Windows, but, but um, you said you could use Bash in your the extensions. Uh, how how does, does that fit with your goal of supporting Windows? Um, okay, so the question was uh, based on Windows and how does it fit with you have rules that explicitly call Bash. I mean, you can only, of course, you always need the tool chain to be present at the, at the target. So there is something like, well, there is Bash for Windows, and if you want to write a rule in Bash as your build language, uh, as your compile language, then you better install Bash. But uh, there are plans to have rules that are specific to a language, like compiling C code, done that with the native tool chain. But if you need a tool, you have to have it on the machine where you're building. There's no magic way around that. Question over there. Over there. Yeah. We will have one more question after that. So if anyone Thank you for your talk. Uh, what is the status of ID integration like IDEA or Eclipse? Oh, status of IDE integration. And you know better because I only use plain Emacs and and command line tools and that works. Of course. But there, there are. So we have an experimental plugin for Eclipse. Um, we have a supported plugin for IntelliJ, which also works with Android Studio. We have an Eclipse for Xcode. We don't uh, a plugin. Sorry, an Eclipse for Xcode. Just, okay, we have a plugin for Xcode, which is also supported. Um, we are looking at providing a plugin for Visual Studio as well, but currently our, our focus is to make Bazel work really well on Windows first before we start integrating with IDEs. Any plans for NetBeans? We don't have any plans for NetBeans right now, but uh, feel free to contribute. <laughs> There's no more question, so it's right on time. Thank you, everyone.